Evolutionists believe that approximately five million years ago, humans and today's apes shared a common ancestor, like here, a fork in the road. Uh, that creature is often referred to as an ape-like creature. They don't like to call it an ape because they're going to argue that this creature evolved into apes, and apes evolving into apes is not impressive. Uh, I'm prepared to accept that ape-like creatures produced apes. Uh, I have a little trouble with the idea that ape-like creatures became humans, and of course that's the whole realm of, uh, of the ape men. Everyone's been told that there are dozens and dozens of these solid, missing link fossils, transitional forms. Oh, so and so man and Java man and Piltdown man and Cro-Magnon man, Neanderthal man. Essentially, all of Homo erectus would be just human beings. Don't just believe urban myths of the proofs of evolution, like junk DNA, like missing link fossils. The secular world teaches that you evolved from some ape-like ancestor that there was no Adam and Eve. Oh, and since there's no Adam and Eve, well, then there was no fall into sin, which means there's no need for a savior. So see, the secular anthropology not only does it attack the authority of the Bible, it attacks the very gospel itself. And ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly the issue that we face today. This subject is so important. It is critically important that we understand the truth about creation, evolution. Were there any supposed ape men? Are there any such things as ape men? Hey, my name is Eric Coven. I'm the president of Creation Today. We are a nonprofit organization that helps people and churches really understand and know how to turn these seemingly insurmountable stumbling blocks that keep people from coming to Christ into rock solid stepping stones on their journey to understand the truth about God's word and God's world and how it all comes together. I want to give a shout out to our Creation Today partners out there. Thank you guys for making this possible. It really is amazing. You guys actually help us take this information, uh, not just to people that we get to go speak to, but literally around the world. And i uh, got some cool partners. Shout out to Glenn in South Dakota. Thanks for being a partner with Creation Today. Holly over in Louisiana. Thank you so much for being one of our partners. Uh, Jamie from Canada, Canada. Thank you so much. Boy, you guys need the truth up there. We all do, man. Our world is just crazy. Johan over in Germany, thank you. Hey, going to be speaking at Creaticon coming up here in a couple of weeks. I'm excited about that. So if you're not sure about uh, what's going on with Creaticon, uh, Johan, love me. I'll, uh, I guess we need to send out an email about what's happening with that. It's going to be cool. And then Lawrence from uh, right here in Florida, my home state. Thank you, guys. And I got a bunch of you on live as well. Thank you guys for joining me. Uh, really appreciate it. Andrew and... Uh, and Diana, Diana, you're always on. Doesn't matter when we're when we're going live. Uh, really excited about this. Hey, if you want to learn more about becoming a Creation Today partner and helping us do what we do, you can go to creationtoday.org and learn how to be a Creation Today partner. Today's conversation is incredibly, incredibly important. So I've invited a friend uh, of of mine, Dr. Terry Mortensen. He's uh, lectured a, for the past 26 years, I believe now. Uh, all over the world on the creation versus evolution subject, why this is so important. He's got his PhD in the history of geology. Uh, worked actually for Campus Crusade for Christ for several years uh, over in Europe and now uh, helps lead Answers in Genesis and their scientific team as they talk about some really incredible things. Dr. Mortensen and I recently got to go on the Grand Canyon trip and that was incredible. Uh, this was a, an invitation from Dr. Mortensen to me, and I said, I would love to do this. And we got to spend 10 days, go all the way through the Grand Canyon and see some unbelievable sights. This one right here that you're looking at was really, really memorable because uh, the guides that, that took us, Dr. Terry and then Dr. John and Dr. Andrew Schnelling and then Dr. Jeremy Lyons, uh, they took us to this spot, and right behind us you can see uh, the granite and the schists, that's a type of rock. I'm not using a bad word there. Uh, it's, it's literally this rock that was the foundation of the world and where it meets the judgment layers, uh, the very first layers that have fossils in them, foundation meets the flood. Uh, just incredible and a moving place to sit there and talk. So, Dr. Mortensen, how are you doing today, sir? Hey, good to be with you. Thank you so much for taking time to talk to us about something that I think there's a lot of confusion on in the world today. Were there ever anything such things as cavemen or 
missing links? And maybe even that's a confusing question. Uh, why, why do you, why do you do what you do? Why have you been spending the last, it's been more than 26 years of your life dedicated to helping people understand the truth of God's word. Why do you do this? Well, um, it really matters who we are and where we came from. Uh, if you view yourself as simply an animal descended from some other animal, which descended from pond scum that formed by chance in the primordial ocean three and a half billion years ago uh, on an earth that formed by chance around a sun that formed by chance as a result of a big bang that happened by chance, then that means you are simply an accident, yeah. an accident of time and chance and the laws of nature. And uh, we, we could, you and I could give many quotes by evolutionists who say, on that basis of that view of life, there is no basis for um, moral absolutes. There's no ba basis for purpose and meaning in life. And uh, it, that worldview destroys the uh, trustworthiness of the Bible, which is where we get the gospel. So it, it really matters what we believe about origins. Well, in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26, then God said, let us make man in our image. And that really is the key difference from a biblical worldview, guys. We believe that man is different from the animals. And that's we need to talk about that because many of you learned in school that there was, you know, some some kind of missing link might have happened or, you know, there's there's of course, we've all heard of cavemen. Uh, we, we made our creation today T-shirts designed off of the, the idea that people have gone from ape to human and that entire thing is made up. We'll talk about that. We said the real journey for mankind starts with somebody repenting and that leads to them being a fully devoted worshiper of Jesus Christ, their one and only Savior, to say, hey, here's the truth. So we know the icons are out there. It's in cultures around the world teaching an evolutionary worldview. Uh, Dr. Mortensen, you uh, have learned a little bit about cavemen. Um, what's the difference between, and maybe in your presentation, you'll share this with us, but what's the difference between a, a caveman and a missing link? Or is that, are they kind of synonymous or what's, what's the difference there? Well, I, th I think really in a sense, they're, they're synonymous. It's just that the caveman is one of the advanced closer to modern humans missing links. So, you know, you have a 100% ape uh, and then you have something that's maybe 90% ape, 10% human, and you go along the line and, and just before humans, you get to Cro-Magnon and Neanderthals and then, then there's us. So it, those are all supposedly links to modern man. And somewhere along the way, they decided, oh, let's live in a cave instead of climbing a tree. Aha, caveman. Got yeah. it. Exactly. So we called this Meet the Flintstones uh, because um, a lot of evolutionists for years have been very frustrated by the Flintstones show because the Flintstones shows humans and dinosaurs coexisting. And they're like, that's not true. That didn't happen. Um, I had here, uh, I pulled up a report from the LA Times. Headline was Fred Flintstone and the rest of the bedrock Denzians are helping teach kids in a new display at the Natural History Museum. <clears throat> Excuse me, one of the quotes in here, they said, hey, fantasy aside, dinosaurs and humans never coexisted. So what's Fred Flintstone doing in the dinosaur exhibit at the Los Angeles County Museum of Natural History? That was another slide, but you missed it. Go to the next one. Um, our thoughts was that since for so long, the Flintstones have been shown with dinosaurs this was an opportunity. Uh, this was an opportunity to put in perspective that dinosaurs were dead many years before humans existed. And yet when they went around and asked the kids, like, hey, what did you think? Did this help you? The kids were like, you know, we we thought dinosaurs and man lived together when we were little, is what Alex said. And uh, can you go back one slide, bud? Uh, but now we know they weren't at a Jennifer just cavemen and stuff. So they still, these kids still didn't get what they were trying to say, which is no man and dinosaurs didn't live together. And then the, the writer of this article said, don't worry, her two companions immediately set her straight to let her know, uh, no, that wasn't the case. I guess I should have reviewed these slides with you. But hey, I'll go to, I'll go to that one. No, uh, USGS, I want to know how you know you're right, because if you go to usgs.gov, government website, and ask the question, did people and dinosaurs live at the same time? The first thing they say, no, 
No way after the dinosaurs, after all the dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. So what makes you right and them so wrong, Dr. Mortensen? We got to get into this and look at the science. Okay. Um, take us through the journey of cavemen. I mean, your, your history of geology, so you've studied a lot about how the evolution worldview formed. Take us on a journey of, uh, from, from this idea that we were created in God's image to now a lot of people believe that there are tons of missing links. What's the truth? What's the science? What's the facts? What do we need to know? Well, just, just uh, briefly, a little history here. A lot of people think that uh, the problem about origin started with Charles Darwin, but it really started over 50 years before Darwin published his famous book in 1859. And it started in geology, not in biology, as uh, deist and atheist uh, geologists. Well, to be accurate, we'd have to say they were amateur uh, geologists who were wealthy. And so they had a lot of money and time to go out and look at rocks and fossils. But back in the late 19th and or late 18th and early 19th century, there were no university degrees in geology. There were no paid professional geologists. So it was in the infancy of geology and geology got locked into this idea of millions of years. And that laid the foundation for Darwin's theory of biological or uh, evolution. Uh, slow, gradual processes over millions of years explains the, the rocks and fossils of the earth. And then Darwin said, slow, gradual biological processes explain the origin of life. And then his book in 1871, uh, The Descent of Man, uh, the, or, dealt with the, the evolution of man. And then we got the Big Bang Theory in the 20th century. And, but it, it's all started with the rejection of the, the biblical history in Genesis, uh, particularly Noah's flood and the age of the earth. So really, we're looking at just a little sliver, a piece of the, the pie when it, when it comes to the whole worldview of the evolution worldview that now teaches a concept of a big bang and animals evolving over millions, billions of years into what we have today. We're taking on one little section of that pie and destroying that little piece today. Yeah, I, I would put it in a, a little bit different way of three concentric circles. So you have biological evolution to explain the origin of life, plants, animals, people, microbes from non-living matter. Um, and then geological evolution to explain the origin of the earth uh, which was formed in the gas cloud around the sun that flattened into a disk, which evolved into rings, and the rings evolved into the planets. Uh, and then over millions of years, rock layers and fossils formed. And then you've got cosmological evolution to explain the origin of stars and galaxies and planets and comets and solar systems. And all of that evolutionary story is based on the assumption that we can explain everything by time plus chance plus the laws of nature, the laws of physics and chemistry and genetics. That's all we need. Um, there's no God, or if he is, he's, he's irrelevant to the question of origins. And um, that's the, the worldview, this, the set of assumptions that are controlling science today. And so they're trying to explain man, the origin of man, the origin of language, the origin of culture, by time plus chance plus the laws of nature. Well, they've certainly done a good job at saturating the world with this idea. For all you homeschool kids, this is what you should have drawn in your notes. Okay, I'm not the best drawer, but I got your three concentric circles right there of what's really going on. Okay. Time plus chance plus laws of nature. Now, where did time come from? Where did laws of nature? Oh, you, I did it wrong. Yeah, they're concentric going out. Concentric. <laughs> all right, I'm, I'll start my notes all over, Dr. T. Okay, all right, all right, concentric. So, but you know, Eric, like, it's really important to, to understand that because that's right. Because a lot of people, when they hear the word evolution, they only think of biological evolution. True. And so they think, well, the age of the earth doesn't matter. But it was the millions of years that laid the foundation for Darwin's theory. And if he didn't, if he didn't have a scientific community that was already locked into millions of years, his theory would have been dead in the womb. Um, and so he needed that time to try to explain how 
people evolve from a little tiny microbe? So we do attack, I say attack, well, I guess ultimately that's what it is. We feel like, man, there's a worldview war going on between did God create the heavens and the earth or, you know, was it all random chance? And it really is a battle. Even, even the evolutionist side would say it's a battle. That's what we're, we're, we're in a battle of worldviews of who's right. So we get that and we can attack it multiple different ways at, at, Number one, saying, here's the problems with your worldview, with an evolutionary worldview. Uh, number two, we could say, hey, let's set up the biblical worldview. Here's how science agrees with what scripture says. And as we, quote, attack an evolutionary worldview, you can take off, you, you can take on the millions of years aspect. You can take on what we're doing today, the caveman aspect. You can, there's a lot of different ways. The random chance plus time equals, you know, progressive evolution. You know, do, do our genetics, does the information actually develop new information? So a lot of ways to attack that. But if we're going to get into cavemen today, I want to know, have there ever been any real, this is the question I want us to get an answer to. Have there really been any like, oh man, in the scientific world that supports the secular idea that we evolved, this right here is a big challenge for those of you that believe in the Bible. This bone or this caveman or this missing link, this one's a real issue. Or are we going to find there hasn't been one discovery that's a real challenge to the Bible? So take us on that journey. I, wanna, well, I want well, us to learn about this. Yeah, well, let, let's consider one of the uh, really popular missing links of the past few decades. Um, let me uh, share my screen here, see if this works. Um, By the way, while you're doing that, to everybody out there on Facebook and on YouTube, thanks so much for hanging out with us. Uh, this is a blast for us to put together. Just changed to the new times here, uh, 12 o'clock noon on Wednesdays. So glad you guys are joining us. Really appreciate that. Amanda said there's a bunch of you out there. Feel free to uh, add comments in. Please keep them clean so we don't have to kick you off. And we love you. All okay. right, Dr. T. Oh, Lucy, yes. This is a, one of the most famous ones. Yeah, uh, Lucy is more famous than Eve today. Uh, <laughs> wow. and, uh, Donald Johansson was a PhD student at the University of Chicago. He and his team found the bones of Lucy in uh, Ethiopia in 1974. And of course the announcement was the missing link. And um, they only found about 25% of the skeleton, but a, a lot of it was uh, because of the symmetry of the body, they could reconstruct about 70%. But since then, they've, the other scientists have found other Australopithecine, as these are called, Australopithecine fossils. So they now have hand bones and feet bones. and um, so uh, this is how the, the Natural History Museum in London uh, has presented Lucy to uh, visitors huh. in the UK. So you notice that she has human hands, human feet, upright posture, but an ape-like face. Um, but there are even um, respected evolutionists who would say that's a serious misrepresentation of the evidence. And they would say that she was a knuckle walker uh, similar to a bonobo or, or a pygmy tramp or gorilla. So that's the way we've pictured her in our creation museum as uh, Dr. David Menton, who was for 34 years professor of human anatomy at Washington Medical School. He uh, has really studied all of the human fossil evidence uh, and he guided our artists to make this representation, which uh, he, he is strongly convinced the fossil evidence supports that as some evolutionists also say. But uh, here's, here's Lucy in London, and I want to show you some pictures of how Lucy has been represented elsewhere uh, to really shed light on how we're being deceived by art. So uh, Lucy in London, but then the St. Louis Zoo had an exhibit for many years, and that's Lucy in St. Louis. Um, she has more hair, uh, but she still has human hands, human feet, upright posture, but an ape-like face. But, but look at that face. Um, do you see the whites of the eyes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the eyes are not preserved in the fossil record. Yeah, that, they would have a clue. That's pure imagination. And those eyes, those eyes are human eyes. Apes don't have eyes that are, show a lot of white. Those are photographs of real living apes and their eyes are almost completely black or dark brown. They have to really turn and look sideways to see any of the white 
uh, of their eye. But that's, a, that's an imaginary creature created by an evolutionary artist. And just by putting human eyes into the picture, it makes the creature look more human. Um, so that's Lucy in London and Lucy in St. Louis, but the Chicago Field Museum has a Lucy and uh, she's a little more robust, a little more muscular, um, but she still has human hands, human feet, upright posture. But notice that she has a very heavy eyebrow ridge, unlike the other two. Uh, and then this is Lucy in a BBC television program. Uh, her head is, is completely different from the other three, although she does have that unusual hairline. Yeah. <laughs> but that's because the BBC is in London where the Natural History Museum is. And then th those are two other representations in two leading American science magazines. So it, it's any way the artist wants to draw her. And... Uh, the more that they have uh, studied the evidence, the more uh, Lucy has, has kind of fallen by the wayside as not really a, a missing link. She was fully ape, um, but the evolutionists still want the world to believe that she's our ancestor. Uh, then we could talk about, uh, if I can uh, skip ahead a, a little bit, Oh, I, I so, just want to I, I just want to show you this an, another way of illustrating this. Um, so here's here's Lucy in our Creation Museum exhibit. Well, our artists when they did Lucy's head, they took her head uh, based on the fossil evidence, and they made five different uh, heads, all exactly the same, and all they did was change the the skin color. And the, uh, and the hair. They didn't change the, the shape of the head in any way. Um, so those are all examples. Wow. With the same head. The same, the same skull. The same skull, the same skin, the same nostrils. Everything is the same except the color of the skin, the amount of hair, and the eyes. Oh, my goodness. And so, so really, the evidence revolution for Lucy has nothing to do with the bones that were discovered. It has to do with the artist. The artistry exactly. is the evidence. Exactly. Uh, the same thing happens with Neanderthal. Now we're getting closer to man in the evolutionary view. And uh, the first Neanderthal skeletons uh, that were identified as Neanderthal were, were found in 1856 in Germany. And uh, when they uh, drew a picture of what he looked like, this is something of what he looked like, you know, um, pretty muscular, a little bit stooped in the shoulders, ape-like in the head, and not wearing very many clothes. But we need to remember that the clothes are not preserved in the fossil record either. So that's complete imagination. But they found a lot of Neanderthal skeletons in uh, various places in Europe, the Middle East, elsewhere. And there are now even evolutionists who would say that if you dressed up Neanderthal and put him in a, in a Grand Central Station in New York and a Frankfurt airport, uh, nobody would take a, another look because uh, he was human. And uh, I, I read an article a number of years ago in Time Magazine called The Changing Faces of Neanderthal. And they showed how Neanderthals have been represented over the years. So, here you have uh, Harper's Weekly Magazine in 1873. Um, he could be an, an American Olympic athlete. Yeah. Uh, but in 1909, he's ape-like in the head, but, but naked. Then in 1953, he's behaving like some humans, but he's ape-like in the head. In 1984, um, he's perfectly human. 1988, he's showing us that he needs to go to the dentist. But then CNN has him more ape-like in 2006. He has more hair in 2007, and he's completely human in 2008. And uh, the Neanderthal Museum for many years had, had an exhibit where they showed the 1983 version and the 1909 version. And one evolutionist commenting on this uh, said, from his bestial 19th century persona to just another guy in a suit, Neanderthals have been pigeonholed according to the times. Well, like all good museums, the Neanderthal Museum there in Germany has upgraded their exhibits. And so in 2010, this is what they looked like. And uh, the guy on the left has been out in the sun too long. Um, 
and he does have a big nose. But when I'm when I'm lecturing to a live audience, I will stop at this point and say, you know, I've been doing scientific observations during this lecture, and I've noticed that some of you have really big noses. <laughs> and, uh, and so I've been wondering where you are on the evolutionary tree, and that gets a chuckle out of people. But yeah, no kidding. But those I've met those some are people human. with some big noses. Those, those are human. Uh, I'm sure that there are people in the world that look something like that. Um, but then, as as you said, uh, they're often called cavemen because they did uh, bury their dead in caves. They made art in caves. They lived in caves. But George Washington, when he was president of the United States, uh, living in, in luxury there in Philadelphia with Persian rugs on the floor and nice dishes and a toilet in the house, living in the same country where Native American Indians living in teepees, and they didn't have any of those luxuries, but they were just as human as George Washington. And we have people today that in our, uh, our Western arrogance and pride, we call them primitive. Uh, people like the Aborigines of Australia, uh, they're different from us. Uh, they have a different lifestyle, but, but they're fully human and they're Aborigine children who go off to Australian universities. And if you drop me by a helicopter into the forest where they live with just the clothes on my body, uh, even though I have a PhD, uh, I'd, I'd probably be dead in three days. I'd, you know, I'd eat some poisonous plant I wouldn't uh, know how to make a spear or a boomerang. So these people are fully human, just like we are. Are you there? Or did I lose you? Hello? So, a lot of people is that a, an internet provider? That is our internet provider. Yeah, they, they've had to re kind of shuffle everything with everybody doing work from home. So we had them last week. On. Oh, here we go. I'm back on uh, Zoom now. Let me see here. Got it. All right. Oh, I'm getting an echo. All right, you can hear me on Zoom again? I can hear you. I don't see you. Boy, it's still just not quite where it needs to be. Um, guys, hey, for the Creation Today members, I don't know if we're still online on Facebook or YouTube, but for Creation Today members, I'm really sorry about this. Uh, we reached out to our internet provider, and uh, they have reshuffled the, the city of Pensacola on what goes where and what happens last week. And uh, it caused lots of problems. We got in touch with them, and they said, we're good to go. Uh, just gonna have to do some work down here on the nodes. And I'm like, whatever that means, sounds good. Um, but we seem to be good now. So for you guys that are on here, I don't know if anybody's on uh, YouTube or Facebook. Uh, for those of you on here uh, that stuck with that uh, bad connection, thank you guys. We'll try to jump right back into this and, and keep going because I'm finding this a fascinating conversation, realizing that art history, uh, you know, simple art is what is really responsible, make believe is what's responsible for the real evidence behind the evolution worldview so far in Lucy and in Neanderthal. So Dr. Mortensen, if we're still, if we're, uh, now it's telling my internet's unstable again, uh, but let's, let's try to get through a little bit more. And if I have to shut this off and we have to resume this another time, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll figure that out for you guys. Well, it's interesting. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I just saw an article yesterday. I haven't read it in the uh, in the in the technical journal yet, but I uh, just saw a, a news item about it. Some evolutionists have examined uh, museum displays about human evolution and expressed their concern about the art and the misrepresentation of the evidence. So uh, this is man, Doctor Doctor Mortensen. It is it is still it's just not. 
it's not working. It's it's chopping me in and out, in and out, in and out. Um, hmm. Well, guys, I I I love and I hate technology sometimes. Um, this is a, this is a, a local issue here to us. It's not your end. It's not Dr. Morton's end. This is what's going on here on Cummings Road in Pensacola, Florida, with our internet, and it's really frustrating to us. Um, it's I think what is it? What did we get a quote for a, for a fiber line? You guys have fiber up there at the Creation Museum, don't you? Uh, I have. That's beyond my pay grade. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet you do because you guys got a lot of internet going in and out. Yeah. Uh, I think our fiber would be like two grand a month. So I'm not. I'm not. I'm not there. Ah, uh, um, Dr. Mortensen, and to you, Creation Today members and uh, partners that are hanging out with us. Um, I'm going to have to get this with Dr. Mortensen another time and send it to you. It's a fascinating conversation, especially to step through these things and the conclusions I want to come to uh, a little bit more information. Uh, but if he and I, uh, Dr. Mortensen, you okay? Can I, can I get this with you later? And uh, tempted to jump on my cell phone and see if my, my service there is better, but uh, I, I don't think I can make that work. Um, ah, Peter, I'm sorry, Sarah. Thanks for hanging out. I appreciate it. Uh, Mariah, I don't think I've seen you on one of our lives before, so thank you. Um, 